interesting topic. Have a guess. Get your bike back, your teeth, rely on them for a lifelong support. Of course, it is bone loss and pattern of bone destruction in periodontal disease. You all know teeth are incapable of self-repair. So to preserve our teeth, we need a stable foundation which is alveolar bone. Alveolar bone loss and the factors determining it forms the hallmark of a discussion today. Let us start with a brief introduction. Periodontal inflammation, the main offender, when left untreated and due to hyperimmune response along with if any genetic factors will reach the alveolar bone, cause destruction of periodontal ligament fibers resulting in bone loss. Next moving on to the following subheadings under which we are going to discuss. It includes three factors responsible for bone destruction, rate of bone loss, radius of action, periods of destruction with a note on mechanism of action, normal variation and finally the various patterns in bone loss. Let us start with the number one factors causing bone destruction. It is the extension of the inflammation from the marginal gingiva to the supporting periodontal tissue. We all know the fact that periodontitis is always preceded by gingivitis but not all gingivitis progress to periodontitis. On microscopic examination, you can see the gingival inflammation extending along the collagen fiber bundles following the course of blood vessels through the loosely arranged tissues around them into the alveolar bone. Next moving on to spread of inflammation. In the interproximal region, you can see in the figure the spread of inflammation is from gingiva to the bone or from bone to the periodontal ligament or from gingiva into the periodontal ligament. In facial and lingual regions, you can see the spread of inflammation is from gingiva along the outer periosteum or from periosteum to bone or from gingiva to periodontal ligament. A significant factor to note down here is the transeptal fibers that runs across the cementum of the adjacent teeth over the alveolar crust gets recreated due to their self-renewing nature even after destruction. Next moving on to radius of action. So listen carefully for a bone loss to occur, their bone resorbing factor should be present somewhat nearby. So these Weyerhaup measurements had given us the maximum distance between the subgingival plaque and the inflammatory infiltrate and the alveolar bone to cause bone loss. And the effective distance was found to be between 1.5 to 2.5 mm. Beyond 2.5 mm, there will be no bone loss. Later, TAL has confirmed these measurements in human subjects. Now, moving on to rate of bone loss. Here, let me share with you an interesting milepost story. Harald Sloy, a renowned periodontist, conducted a study in Sri Lanka. He was curious to gather Sri Lankan tea laborers who had never practiced oral hygiene in their lifetime. He took 480 individuals and followed them over a period of 20 years for the periodontal disease progression. He was able to do the final examination for 161 individuals to assess the disease progression. Yes, moral issues raised up acceptable but it instills that periodontal disease isn't a constant downward spiral thrust yet it, it is an episodic burst alternating between period of activity and quiescence also the study proved that our body always fight back deploying defense mechanism thereby slowing the rate of progression yet without intervention the cycle continues thus he was able to put forth three distinct patterns of disease progression one, eight percent of the individuals showed a rapid progression with an early attachment loss of 0.1 to 1 millimeter. Eighty percent of the individuals showed a moderate progression with an early attachment loss of 0.5 to 0.05 millimeter. Eleven percent of the individuals showed minimal or no progression with an early attachment loss of 0.05 to 0.09 millimeter and the yearly bone loss was found between 0.2 to 0.3 mm. Now moving on to periods of destruction. As we discussed earlier, periodontal destruction is associated with subgingival plaque and host immune response having an episodic pattern of destruction. Next moving on to mechanism of bone destruction. It can be either bacterial or host mediated. In bacterial, the subgingival plaque will stimulate the bone progenitor cells 
to differentiate into osteoclasts resulting in bone destruction. Also, it will stimulate the gingival cells to release the inflammatory mediators which also results in bone destruction. In host derived, in host produced prostaglandins and the precursors will also cause bone destruction. Next moving on to bone formation in parental disease. Will there be a bone formation in parental disease? Yes, always there will be a bone formation found adjacent to the site of active bone resorption because in order to strengthen the remaining bones. So it plays a dual role both protective and diagnostic, allowing the inherent bone forming tendency. Next moving on to second important factor causing bone destruction is, is the trauma from occlusion. What do you mean by trauma from occlusion? It is the tissue injury that results due to the excessive occlusal forces that exceeds the adaptive capacity of the periodontal tissues. So it can be produced either in the presence or absence of inflammation. When there is absence of inflammation, this trauma from occlusion will cause increased compression and tension of the periodontal ligament fibers causing necrosis and also stimulates the osteoclastic cells causing bone resorption. These changes are reversible when the offending forces are removed. You can see in the radiograph there is thickening of the cervical margins of the interdental bone. When there is presence of inflammation, the destruction will be advanced resulting in bizarre bone pattern. Now moving on to the third factor responsible for bone destruction, it is the systemic disorder. Glickman in the early 1950 considered that there is systemic influence in all cases of periodontal disease. In recent years, studies have shown that there is a relationship between periodontal bone loss and osteoporosis seen in postmenopausal women because they share many risk factors like aging, smoking, diabetes and so on that interferes with the healing. Next moving on to the final part, the various patterns of bone destruction. One is exostosis. They are benign bony outgrowths found in buccal, palatal and lingual regions. It can be flat, spindle, nodular or lobular, torus palatinus and torus mandibularis. Next is fenestration and dehiscence. You can see in the figure fenestration is a window like defect where there is denudation of the alveolar bone but has periosteum and overlying mucosa. Dehiscence it is a cleft like defect with a loss of supporting alveolar bone at least 4 mm apical to the margin of the interproximal bone. Next is the osseous craters. They are concave depressions in the alveolar bone with buccal and lingual walls intact. Difficulty in removing plaque in the interdental areas causes this loss of interproximal bone. Next is ledges. They are plateau like bone margins caused by the resorption of the thick and bony plates. Next horizontal and vertical bone loss. You can see in the figure horizontal bone loss there is symmetrical reduction in the height of the alveolar bone. It is because the disease progression occurs at an even rate. Whereas in vertical bone loss you can see an angular or a funnel shaped defect because the disease progression occurs at different rates. Next is reversed architecture. It is nothing but the reversal of the normal scallop architecture. So there will be loss of interdental bone including the facial and lingual plates without the loss of the concomitant radicular bone. Next is buttressing bone formation also called lifting. It occurs in an attempt to buttress to strengthen or to support the bony trabeculae that are weakened by resorption. So when it occurs within the jaw it is the central buttressing bone formation. When it occurs on the external surface it is the peripheral buttressing bone formation. Next moving on to bulbous bony contours. They are bony enlargements caused either by exostosis or by buttressing bone formation. Next is furcation involvement. Here there is bone loss in the furcation region of the multi rooted teeth. According to Glickman's classification for grade 1 furcation involvement there will be an incipient bone loss. For grade 2 furcation involvement there will be a partial bone loss. For grade 3 furcation involvement there will be a total bone loss. For grade 4 furcation involvement there will be a total bone loss with exposed furcation. For more detail, you can refer to my previous video, a lecture on furcation involvement. 
Now moving on to wall defects, it can be one wall defect, two wall defect, three wall defect or combined osseous defect. Relate to the figure, in one wall defect only one wall will remain and the three walls get involved. So it could be either buckle, label, reset or disc. In two wall defects, two wall gets involved and two wall will remain. It can be either buckle or reset or label or disc. In three wall defects, three wall remains and only one wall is get involved, it forming a deep intra osseous defect. Combined osseous defect, it is the combination of the above that vary in the number and surfaces involved. Conclusion, let us quickly recap what we studied today. 1. Periodontal inflammation plays a primary role in bone destruction. 2. For a bone loss to occur, resorption exceeds formation. 3. The level of bones denotes the pathological experience that have been already undergone. 4. Degree of bone loss not necessarily correlate with the depth of the periodontal pocket. Last but not the least, periodontal disease is not just a cosmetic issue. We have to preserve our foundation, the alveolar bone, for to maintain the functional natural dentition. Well, that brings me to the end of my session. If you have any questions, if you can write it to us, I will be more than happy to help you out. I shall meet you soon with another gripping topic. Thank you.